We welcome you to the media ministries of the Gathering Church in the Countryside YMCA of Mainville. As we love the Lord and each other, we're trusting that God would use us to plant a church in every YMCA around the world. To this end, would you join us? We meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. and in community groups throughout the week. As you listen to this resource, our prayer is that your love for Jesus would grow deep and your love for others would be seen and heard. Good. I'm not Mike. Who are you? My name is Jensen Harper. Uh, I'm a youth pastor up at a church called Antioch. How many of you know Antioch? Raise of hands. Okay, cool. Wow. All right. Who doesn't know? Um, yeah, so I'm the youth pastor up at Antioch. And because of Thanksgiving weekend, we have no student ministries. And Mike is one of my best friends. And I wanted to come down and see what's going on. Usually the way a sermon begins is by me speaking. Um, but this is a pretty sweet gathering uh, of a faith family. So you guys, you just talked about things you're thankful for. What do you guys got? What are some things you're thankful for? Children's church. Thankful for children's Boom. church. Boom. Get them out of here. Let's show you. <laughs> what else we got? You're like, what? You're supposed to do the talking. Yeah. Don't really get them out of here. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Oh, for real. I thought that was a joke. Get out of here. That was hilarious. Yeah, family. Yeah, it's pretty good. What was that? Jesus. Boom. I love that. I love that last song that we sang was that what's the greatest thing in my life is knowing Jesus. <laughs> oh, man. Not a great way to start a sermon to start crying. Um, but man, when I think about Jesus, it, what he's done is pretty remarkable, right? That he took a sinner that was, um, an enemy of God and he came down, even in my guilt, came down and died for me so that I could have a relationship with God. That's pretty sweet, right? And then no matter what happens here in this world, your house burns down is that we still have hope in life because this isn't our home is that we have a heavenly home that we get to be with God forever in. Okay, I promise I won't cry for the rest of the sermon, okay? You ready? Uh, so who am I? Uh, my name is, uh, is Jensen Harper, and I love Jesus. Uh, I'm a youth pastor up in uh, Old Lebanon. And uh, things have been going great. Thanks for asking. And um, it's, uh, it's been awesome. There's been great times in doing ministry uh, in Antioch, and there's been really hard times. And sometimes I feel like I'm doing a great job. Sometimes uh, I don't feel like I do an awesome job. Um, I went to school at Sanford University, and uh, in 2017, I got offered the position to become the youth pastor at Antioch. And I was like, let's go. I want to take the gospel uh, to a place that doesn't have as much access as a place like Birmingham. Um, so I wanted to come back and I was on fire for Jesus. I wanted other people to know about what he's done for me and what he's done for all people. And, uh, I was super fired up and uh, I want to tell you a story about my first year, uh, in ministry, super fired up. And, uh, a lot of things happened that first year. So in 2019, I bought my, bought, bought a house, which is exciting. Uh, my mom was the realtor, Jen Harper, shout out. If you need to buy a house, you can go talk to her. And uh, <laughs> get a card from her afterwards. And uh, I just bought a house, and it's an old house. It's not a cool house. It is actually a cool house. Sorry, Mom. It's a cool house, um, but I had old carpet in it, so I'm cutting it out. And uh, I got a phone call, and um, it was a buddy of mine. Uh, I hadn't got a phone call from him in 10 years or so. He said, Jensen, what are you doing tonight? And I was like, well, I'm wearing... A black corduroy hat with red sweatpants cutting old carpet at so super exciting things and he was like bro uh i'm in cincinnati i'm filming a movie let's hang out tonight and i was like that's a lot to take in while you're cutting old carpet he's like let's hang out tonight and i was like what are you doing here he's like we're filming a movie about middletown and i said i have 
many questions. Who would want to make a movie about Middletown? Um, so I start driving to the address he sends me, and I was thinking that you know the movie being filmed in Middletown, we're going to meet in Middletown. So I start driving, and then I get on 71. And I'm like, this is not the way to Middletown. And I'm still dressed, you know, red sweatpants, black corduroy hat, because I was assuming I'm going to Middletown. So I start driving on 71, and I've realized I'm not going to Middletown. I'm going to downtown Cincinnati. I was scared. I, I, and I said, uh, bro, where are we going again? Like a pizza place or like a place where we're going to shoot pool or something, hopefully. And he was like, no, uh, just follow the address and I'll meet you there. So me and my 05 Honda Pilot start driving down to uh, downtown Cincinnati. I get there, hop out of my car. I scooter down uh, to a place. Uh, I had never been to this part of town. It was just south of OTR. And I roll up on my little bring, bring on my scooter. And I look to see where my, it's like, you have arrived. I was like, great. I look and turn. And it's this big black brick building with like art exhibits behind, like in the window and like people in like cocktail dresses and suits. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> not good. And my friend comes out and he's like, dude, what's up? I was at the Metropole Hotel and Restaurant wearing red sweatpants and a black corduroy hat. I think we actually have a picture of it. Do we have it? There it is. Okay, that's what I looked like this day. And, uh, what I'm about to tell you is like my rotational story that I tell at like parties. It's like my only cool story. So if I come back and preach again, I have, this is like my coolest story. Okay. And the reason why this picture was taken was because the, afterwards, my mom loved it so much that she was like, I have to take a picture of you. Uh, so she saw me the day after. So this is a day after the story I'm about to tell you. So um, I get to the Metropole. Um, I, it's one of those places that has like the three dollar sign like on Yelp and you're like for a guy that just parked his 05 Honda Pilot in red sweatpants and a quarter of black hat not a good thing to see and I was like oh shoot and my buddy finds me and he's like bro what's up I give him a hug this is awesome this is crazy what are you doing here and he was like dude we're filming this movie and I was like great so it's just you and I hanging out right and he's like well do you want to meet everyone <laughs> I'm not going to say no, but also I'm dressed like this. So I was a little scared. And he was like, bro, come in and meet everybody. And I'm like, what does everybody mean? And so I walk in, I go to the back, I turn the corner, and sitting at a banquet table, let me make sure I get all of the names right, was <laughs> Ron Howard, Glenn Close, Amy Adams, and our newest senator, J.D. Vance. And I'm in my red MC Hammer, you know, sweatpants. Like... Oh, this is going so poorly. How did I get myself into this situation? I can't blend in looking like this. Uh, so what do I start doing? Like act like a street performer that just stumbled into the Met? I don't know. Uh, all of a sudden, I see in the corner of my eye. I'm serious. This is my coolest story. I promise it happened like this. And I was talking with some people. Well, first of all, oh no, I feel like I'm running out of time already. But I'll tell this quick little aside. Uh, how many of you have read the book, Hillbilly Elegy? Okay, so my friend was in the movie, the Netflix adaptation of Hillbillyology, and I read the book, and it was awesome. And I try to, like, this wasn't in my notes. I'm going a little off script, and I was talking, and I was like, hey, I'm Jensen. Like, sorry, I'm dressed like this. You look great, whatever. I thought I was going to be in a crappy part of town. And she's like, Middletown? I was like, yeah. She's like, yeah, I know. I'm from there. I'm like, oh, no. I was like, what's your name? She's like, I'm Aunt Wee. And I'm like, you're Aunt Wee? And I was like, this is great. I just look like this, and I offended her. And anyways, as I'm talking with Aunt Wee, I see in the corner of my eye a redhead start walking towards me. And I was like, I'm pretty sure Amy Adams is walking. How many of you know who Amy Adams is? Okay, she was in a movie called Enchanted. She's been in a bunch of different ones. She's like incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and I see this redhead start walking by. I was like, oh, I, I think that's her. But I wasn't, I, just, I think I, in my mind, I was just staring straight ahead. Aunt Wee was talking to me and I was just like, but I know what's going on over here. She walks straight up to me and she goes, hi, I'm Amy. And I'm really glad my body responded with, I'm Jensen, because my brain was just screaming, don't say anything about Superman, you know, like that's where my mind was at. I was like so scared. And then our conversation kind of took a turn. Um, she started asking me about what I do for a living. And I was like, huh? uh, 
work for a church, you know, and you know what we perceive Hollywood and LA to be like. I was a little nervous and she's like, that's great. I grew up Church of Christ and Mormon. And I was like, how does that work? But I, I, didn't, I didn't actually say that. But I was a little like, oh, what? And I didn't say that, um, but I was like, that's awesome. And she goes, this is crazy. She goes, what does your church believe? I was like, oh, okay. This is like in T-ball where the ball's just sitting there on the tee. And I just, all I have to do is just hit it. And so I got to share uh, with Amy Adams the gospel. And it was an awesome conversation. I was killing it, people, right? I was like, substitutionary atonement. Boom. It was sick. Didn't end so well because she goes, you know, Jensen, Jesus never claimed to be divine or God. And I said, another, uh, all those sword drills that I grew up with, all those memory verses out the window. I was like, I didn't know how to respond. And I kind of said, well, he said that he was the son of God. I guess that's deity, right? And she just kind of looked at me like, I don't know. And then the next conversation was, what do you think about Donald Trump? And I'm like, where is this conversation going? How do I even get into this? I, should I just dance my way out of this? I don't know what to do. Many of us, when we think about wanting to share about the good news of Jesus, when we say, this is the greatest thing in my life, we want to tell other people about it. Sometimes these conversations go great. You get to share with them. Sometimes you don't get to share. Sometimes you share and they reject it. Sometimes they... You share and they start talking about Donald Trump, right? Many of us have these experiences. We know the gospel and we want to reach people for Jesus. Yet, for many of us, this experience is much more challenging uh, than we would like it to be. However, Jesus commands in the scripture, what, what's, the, what's the last thing that he says in, in Matthew and in Luke? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, right? Right? Our last words are really important, right? If, if someone were about to go away for a long time, you usually remember the things that he said. And I think God used that intentionally. Jesus intentionally said those words. The last things he said was, what's the most important thing? Why is it called the Great Commission? Because it's great. Go therefore and tell other people about me. Teach them and baptize them. So no matter where you are today, feeling like, I am crushing it. There's Children's Church. No matter where you are today, whether you're crushing it, you feel like I'm growing in evangelism or you feel like I, I have not shared my faith in over a year. All we're trying to do today is read God's word and move the needle marginally because there's no standard that we have to reach where it's like, you know what? He maxed out his evangelism meter. He's good. He maxed out his great commission meter. He's good. All of us have room to grow in this particular area. And it should be something that is a focal point in our churches and in our lives because it's great. It's the Great Commission and it's the gospel. That we need to tell other people about the gospel. It's very, very important, really plain and simple. So let's read and see what God has in store for us. Okay, so let's go there. Um, what do we got? Acts 8 26 through 40. Okay. Oh man, let's get after it. I'm going to read this and then we're going to pray. All right. I think we're all there. Let's get after it. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him. And heard him reading the Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shear is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. 
And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Great softball question. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotos. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all towns until he came to Caesarea. Father, this is your word. Lord, uh, help my words fade and your words shine through. Is that you have chosen to speak these words. Help me simply to be a messenger for my heart and for the rest of us to understand this truth and to apply it to our lives. Lord, help us not be hearers of the word, but doers. You're worth doing things for. Jesus, you are so good. Help us live out the Great Commission. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, if you're taking notes, my sermon title for today is this. Ready? See some pens clicking. Okay, you ready? Uh, intro to Angel Communication and Teleportation. Okay? <laughs> so good. Uh, no, the uh, uh, sermon title is The Great Commission Continued. Okay? What is the Great Commission? Matthew 28 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, um, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus ends with, And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So what is the Great Commission? It's telling other people about Jesus. And not just telling them about the person of Jesus and his work, but teaching all the things that he had said. So the apostles' ministry is super important. But this is not just for the apostles that walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus. This is for us today. Wouldn't it be weird if we opened up the book of Acts, which is shorthand for the Acts of the Apostles, and after reading all four of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it, we read multiple accounts of Jesus saying, go, tell it was about me. Wouldn't it be weird if like only a handful of the apostles and disciples were just like, yeah, well, we were super busy that day. I mean, our kids had swim class and you know the temple needed cleaning. I, it would be weird, right? That would be most of our response. It seems pretty legitimate. But the problem is, is that's still happening 2000 years later, is that many of us read these really important words and we don't do these things. It's not a focal point of our life. It's usually sort of reserved for the, the, the varsity Christian, the person that's really mature in their faith. And the reality is, is that there's, through both Matthew 28 and Luke 24, there's no standard for who should share or a, a time or you know, a level of maturity before someone may share. It says, if you're one of my disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. This is for everyone. He said it to all of them. All of us, if we're following Jesus, fall into this category of, of, of obeying the Great Commission. Lifeway recently put out some research about how well American Christians are sharing their faith in Jesus and the openness unchurched people are to hearing about him. And I thought this was fascinating. While 47% are open to general religious conversations, 79% of the unchurched say they don't mind their Christian friend talking about their faith. Only three in 10 unchurched Americans say a Christian has ever shared with them one-on-one -on -one how a person becomes a Christian. So what does that mean? That means at worst, one in two people you interact with, strangers, are open to hearing about the message that can save them from eternal judgment. And at best, this means about 80% of your friends, right? That's what it says. 79% uh, of the unchurched say they don't mind their Christian friend talking about their faith. This means that about 80% of your friends are opening, open to hearing about the good news of Jesus. Yet many of us will withhold this message from them. If you're anything like me, you know that this area of sharing the gospel is the weakest area of my Christian life. But I'm hoping today that as we drop into this text that we see an exciting story of an ordinary guy that listens to the prompting of the Spirit, God himself, 
He goes and shares to a person that's open to religious conversation and ultimately becomes baptized and becomes a Christian. That this actually breathes life into an area that can be a weakness for all of us. It would be really easy for me to come up here and say, what's wrong with you? Many people are, it's very easy to say, to call out weaknesses in other people. But many of us need to grow in helping each other in areas of weakness. So hopefully today I, I preach to serve, um, not to um, condemn or to call out anyone to make them feel bad. But for us collectively to grow in this area that in my life and probably I assume yours is the weakest area in our Christian faith. So how did he, how did he do it? How did Philip do this thing that all of us see as a weakness in our life? What can we learn from Philip? Here's the three points. Okay. What are the three things that Philip did that he had that helped him go and see this person come to saving faith in Christ? Okay. So one, a willingness to go. Philip had a willingness to go. And all three of these start with a willingness. Okay. So one, a willingness to go. Two, a willingness to engage. Three, a willingness to share. Okay. One, a willingness to go, a willingness to share. Lastly, a willingness to, I'm sorry, I messed that up. Willingness to go, engage, share. Okay. So let's start there. One, a willingness to go. Verse 26 through 28, an angel of God calls Philip to leave the revival that's happening in Samaria. The passages before Acts 8 is actually talking about how Philip is going town to town and sharing the gospel. And people are responding to this gospel message very well. All logic would point to, Philip, you should stay and, and be a part of all the awesome things that are happening here. This revival, people coming to know Christ. That would make sense. But God calls him to leave the revival in Samaria and go where? To a desert place. He listens to God, leaves the amazing, and he goes to the desert to, to carry on the amazing things happening. Isn't this kind of the gathering story, right? Amazing things happening in Lebanon. Amazing things happening in Antioch. People are coming to know Christ. And then a team left Antioch to go take that message, what's happening in Lebanon, taking that to a new city. That's your message. And so if you're here today and wondering, why should I listen to this message? One, is to, for us to grow personally and individually. Two, it's to remind you of why you left. Why did you guys leave Antioch to come here? And I'll jump ahead a little bit. It's because of the song that we sang earlier. Because Jesus is the greatest thing in our life. We, this, this message is urgent. We have to take this message to the nations. That's what God said. Jesus himself said in Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of what? All nations. That's why we need to grow in church planting. And why is church planting and missions usually stifled? It's because we're not great at sharing our faith. So today's message, I believe, will help us strengthen something uh, for us personally. Then also help us strengthen what we're doing here corporately as well. So let's get some facts straight, okay? Who is this man that Philip is talking to? We know Philip is a disciple. And honestly, we don't know much about Philip, okay? He's just ordinary dude, walked with Jesus, right? I guess that's pretty special. But ordinary guy, right? So who is the eunuch? What is a eunuch? A eunuch means he doesn't have any reproductive organs. Why is that important? It's important because in those days, particularly, right? It was Judaism and then Christ came, he fulfilled the law. And then the way formed, which is Christianity. But many of these people that were a part of Judaism and are now a Christian, many of them adhered to right, Old Testament law. What did the Old Testament law have to say about eunuchs? Well, we'll talk about two texts. The first one is Deuteronomy 23.1. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you. It says this, that no one whose male organ is cut off shall enter into the assembly of the Lord. Why is this important? 
This means that a eunuch, someone without these reproductive organs, couldn't be fully accepted into the family of God. They wouldn't have been fully accepted by the Jewish community. So then the question is, why was he reading it? Okay, or why was he reading Isaiah? I guess that's a better way of putting it. He was reading Isaiah because Isaiah was super significant for actually eunuchs. Okay, um, Isaiah 56, 4 and 5 says this. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold, my, hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. For a eunuch that had no chance of having sons or daughters, this, would have, this text would have been inspiring. It would have been captivating because I don't have to put, I'm talking as the eunuch, I don't have to put my hope, my joy, my security here in the things of this world because one day I will receive a name everlasting. I will receive a name that is better than sons and daughters. Mini sermon. Friends, lift your eyes to God. Look to find all joy and satisfaction in him because the things, the things of this world will let us down. Lift your eyes to the one that fully satisfies. Because no one has promised to have sons or daughters. No one's promised to be married, to have kids. We're not promised anything in this world. But when we choose to follow Jesus, there are promises that we can bank on and lean into fully. And that's him. So how did Philip engage this man? He listened to God's leading in his life. He acted on it. He was aware of what was happening around him. He went to a place that the Lord had called him to, and he was looking for God to use him. His disposition in reaching people for Jesus wasn't like, yeah, I'll see. I'll sit back and see what happens. Philip intentionally went to the desert looking for opportunities. He was listening to the Lord. Lord, use me however way you want. And he went and he left. This was his disposition towards ministry and living the Christian life. How often are you living your life on mission? You're seeing your life in these terms is that now my life is not my own, it's Christ's. How may I be Christ wherever I go today? And that's actually good news, right? Because many of us actually wrestle with, with purposelessness. We're bored in life sometimes. Don't you want your life to have more meaning? Is that now a boring, ordinary trip to the grocery store can be full of purpose and meaning? Because you are looking to give others hope and joy and meaning and purpose in Christ. Have you ever thought about redeeming your time at the countryside walk? So when you go there, you're not just going there just to, you know, lift weights or to, you know, actually just the other day, it was actually really sweet. Dina at the front desk at the countryside walk, I was lifting and afterwards she, she just did this so well. As I was leaving, she just stopped me. She's like, Jensen. I felt like that the Lord um, wanted me to pray for you. Can I pray for you? And I was so encouraged. I'd already written these words, but I was so encouraged by what she did. And I was like, how often am I praying for people when I go to the Y? How often am I looking to start gospel conversations with people? I'm realizing more and more every day how self-centered I can be, that I live my life on my terms, and I just want to do what makes me feel good. I'm still, guys, I'm still breaking from these patterns of saying, my life is not my own anymore. I've given it to the one with an everlasting name that's better than sons and daughters, that's better than an undisturbed uh, lift at the Y, that's better than X, Y, Z. How often do we think about our lives in these terms that we're now on mission for Jesus? So verse 29, a willingness to engage now. Okay, so we had a willingness to go. Philip was willing to go. He went. Now, what did he do once he got there? He engaged. Verse 29, Spirit says, go over to that chariot. Philip starts running. <laughs> Runs up. Hey, you know what you're reading? His response? No, I don't. No idea. What a great question. 
spirit-led question leads to ultimately this person's conversion. He didn't like pull volt onto the chair and be like, repent and be baptized. He just went, hey, do you know what you're reading? That's pretty normal, right? Go over to the chariot, starts running. Hey, you know what you're talking about? No. Ultimately, this guy gets baptized because of it. Pretty normal thing. And hopefully we're, we're demystifying this whole thing of evangelism. One spirit-led question led to one person's conversion. I went to a college where I didn't know anyone. I wanted to meet um, some people, so I went on a Christian freshman retreat. Uh, I was sitting down on a bus, and a guy sporting a massive straw hat with a severe farmer's tan um, sat down and started talking really loudly. And uh, I kind of wanted to jump in and just start getting to know this guy. He was so loud. I, it was so annoying. And he just kept talking and talking and talking. And the more he talked, the more angry I got. And then he said something that really crossed the line that no Christian should ever say, I hate Tim Tebow. That crossed the line. And I said, just very calmly, I was trying to stay calm. I think I said it calmly. I said, how do you hate Tim Tebow? <laughs> oh, well, he's not even that good at football. Okay. Uh, Heisman Trophy winner. It's fine. National champion. Uh, he's not even that good looking. Okay. Farmer's tin and straw hat. And this guy was a little husky. So not great. And he's, like, he's not even that good of a guy. I was like, okay, that's it. And right as I was going to try to throw this like flying left hook, like we started being ushered off the bus. And I was like, okay, man, thanks for holding me back. You know, I was about to get into it. And uh, yeah, so I went on, had a great retreat. And a couple weeks later, I was at a soccer game. And uh, I saw... <laughs> I saw uh, this guy uh, walking up, and he was on crutches. And I was like, that's what you get for disrespecting Tim Tebow. <laughs> and uh, he noticed me, and he comes over, and he starts talking with me. And he, he goes, uh, hey, weren't you a guy asked me about Tim Tebow? I said, yeah. And uh, we started talking. And uh, nine years later, he's one of my best friends. Uh, we actually just texting last night. He's sending pictures of his uh, newborn baby, Cash. And uh, he's one of my best friends. I don't have a picture up there, but yeah. Mom, Dad, that's Mac. So yeah, that's Mac. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one question. How do you hate Tim Tebow? Led to a lifelong of friendship. And even when I didn't think it went well, God used it. And now I have one of my best friends in the world. Questions can lead to many opportunities. Asking simply, how can you hate Tim Tebow led to a lifelong friendship. Philip's engaging question led to a man's salvation. Philip led with a pretty normal question that led to an incredible ministry moment. Pretty special. Do you know what you're reading? He responds, nope. How am I supposed to if no one explains it to me? That is an excellent point. Listen to the words of Romans 10, 17. It's through hearing comes believing. People can't be Christians if they don't hear the gospel, right? What is the gospel is that all of us stand condemned before God, not because he hates us, but because we all have broken his law. A bad judge would be one that hears the account guilty and then lets them go. All of us have broken God's law. And in the book of James, it says, breaking one point, you've broken all of them. We've broken God's law. He is a good judge, and he has to judge us. And what is the outcome of that judgment? It's guilty. We have to tell this good news to people. Why? Because people can go on through life and not know that they're guilty. But that's the bad news of the good news. The good news is, is that you can be made right with God. That because of Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross that paid for your sins, he didn't just pay one time and it's just like, well, I'm going to keep making this payment over time so they stay innocent. Jesus made a one-time payment for you and I so that we could have peace with God. And if people don't hear that message, they still stand condemned. They still stand guilty. People need to know this message. 
We need to tell others about the good news of Jesus. If you want to start telling people about Jesus, ask good questions. Jesus asked 307 questions in the Bible. He obviously thought they were a pretty good way of communicating with others about the gospel. Here's some really good ones, right? You know, I'm telling you, start asking better questions. What are some good ones that I've found to be really effective? Okay, here's some really good ones to start with for after church, okay? So like you have church, you hear a message, you hear the gospel talk, and then you see a friend that you know might not believe in Jesus or, or is submitted to him. You can ask this, how was church for you? How often do we do that? We have church, it's like, ah, how was your Thanksgiving? Oh, okay, great. You know, how about the Ohio State game? You know, what about, you know, X, Y, Z? This is when people are most spiritually sensitive is that they just heard the gospel and you're just going to, the, the most important, the greatest thing we can know in our life, really important things. And we just go, ah, do you get a cracker dressing? It's like, those are good things. Maybe a lead in into that conversation. But how often, even in a church, do we forget that we're on mission? How often do we do that? How was church for you? What verse stood out to you? These are some great ones. Here's some good ones for when you're outside of church and in public. What did faith look like for you growing up? What does faith look like for you now? Right? Just starting conversation. You know, uh, for me, it's really easy because I get to talk about my job. You know, what do you do for a living? Uh, I mow lawns. What do you do for a living? I am a pastor. Whoa! You know, we, Mike and I were talking about this the other day. Matt Chandler has this thing where it's just like, ultimately, when this comes up and people find out that you're a Christian, people find out that you go to church, just lean into it. Don't be ashamed of it. Yeah, I love Jesus. It's the most important thing in my life. What does faith look like for you in your life? Super simple question. And then ultimately, if you really want to get specific about where this person's at with Jesus, is ask him this. If you stood before God and he asked you why you should let you in, what would you say? So end of your life, you die, you go to see God, and he asks you, why should I let you in? This is a really good question in figuring out where someone is with Jesus. Because a lot of times we point to, well, because I had faith. Because I tried really hard. Well, I showed up to church a lot. Well, I tried my best. That sounds really humble and kind of Christian. I tried my best to be a good follower of Jesus. Trying your best doesn't get you into heaven. Our best that we can have access to is the death and resurrection of Jesus. If our answer ever starts with me, I, you've already missed the point. That we get to heaven. We get to escape judgment, not because of how hard we tried and how much faith we tried to exercise, but because of who we're with, who we're in tow with. It's Jesus. That's what we're trying to share with people. Is the person of Jesus, the ones that the one that atones for our sins, not just past and present, but future, is that our future is secure in Jesus. And then lastly, we have a willingness to share. Okay. So verse 34, uh, and the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scriptures, told him the good news about Jesus. You know, Philip, when he asked this question, he didn't go, you know, hey, you know what you're reading? He's like, no. And then he's like, so... What is this guy talking about? Is he talking about himself or Jesus? And what would have been really PC, politically correct, for Philip to do would be like, uh, you know, how about you just discover it for yourself when we see? Friends, we can't just sporadically ask questions to get people into heaven. We have to proclaim who Jesus is. We have to tell people about the person of Jesus. The first two are the means to the end of sharing. D. 
you hear that? Is that we have to go in order to ultimately get to sharing. But going is not the end. It's the means to the end. Asking a good question is also the means to the end. To the end of what is to share about the good news of Jesus. Because going doesn't, doesn't mean a whole lot if you never share. Asking good questions doesn't mean a whole lot if you never share. But here's what you might be hearing. Make them a disciple. Make sure they're a disciple. This is not our work. We are messengers. You can actually walk into an evangelism encounter and say, here's the gospel. And then from there, follow up with them and ask good questions. How did you respond to this? What do you think? And if they say no, that doesn't mean you like lost your good noodle star in heaven or lost the crown or whatever. It just means that they're not a Christian or they don't want it. And then if they say no, continue to serve and bless that person. Are we living our life on mission and in these terms? But many of us, when we think about this good news, we think about it in terms of bad news, right? I don't want to tell people that they're sinners. I don't want to tell people that they have a problem. And, and yes, there's certainly hard truths about the gospel. But if our lens stays fixed on us as humans, that's where it starts to become self-centered and we start having negative feelings about it. But if the focus stays on Christ, because that's what Philip did. He exalted Jesus in the scriptures. He didn't just look at you know, him and be like, you know what? Here's the deal, eunuch. You don't have any reproductive organs. Like You're pretty jacked up, aren't you? He didn't say that. He said, this person that Isaiah is talking about, that's Jesus. Jesus is the greatest thing, greatest person we can know. We preach Jesus. Now, sin is a vehicle to talking about Jesus, right? That's why Jesus came and died for us on the cross, is that God had wrath that he wanted to pour out on the world because of sin. Jesus came and he stood in our place. But doesn't it stop there? The cross is not just negative good news, right? We stopped God's wrath from, Jesus stopped his wrath from coming. This is actually good news because God took us from enemies of him to friends. Think about the person of Jesus, God himself. He didn't change character. He was still God. And he hung out with sinners. He loved them. He asked good questions. He had compassion on them. We need to preach this good news that God loves people. <laughs> you know, in very solid biblical churches, sometimes we forget that the wrath of God needs to be coupled with the love of God. And sometimes in more progressive or less theologically rich churches, we forget that God's wrath is actually has to be poured out on people. We have to have a balanced approach to sharing the good news. But it is good news. It's because all humans can be made right with God. Not by any of their good works or good deeds. Isn't that good news? Is that we don't have to strive and keep trying to ascend to the hill, right? That's in the Psalms. Try our best to one day make it into heaven. But we can have certainty that Christ's life was good enough. That he died on the cross so that we could be with him forever. That's the good news of Jesus. And it's good news because we don't have to try really hard every day and wonder, what does God think of me? We can put our hope and trust in the person of Jesus. The unaccepted can be accepted by him. That's what Philip did for this eunuch, a person that was on the outside looking in, that would never be fully accepted by the Jewish community, that had no hope for life because he couldn't have, he couldn't start a family, couldn't do these things. Philip gave him hope with a name everlasting, and that name is Jesus. Jesus loved 
that eunuch, and he died for him. Jesus loves you, and he died for you. This is the good news. So in conclusion, we'll recap verses 38 and 40. After Philip gets done explaining the gospel to the eunuch, it seems to me the eunuch responded positively to the call of following Jesus, right? He gets baptized. It seems like he understood. He said, sign me up. I'm all in now. Let's get baptized. So they stop and baptize the eunuch. It's a pretty incredible story. One question leads to one salvation. One question from an ordinary guy leads to an incredible, extraordinary experience. So what's the rest of the story? The eunuch gets baptized. Philip, I assume, did the dunking. Uh, as the eunuch comes up out of the water, boom, he's gone. Philip is gone. Why did God have to do that? What in the world? Like, that's just weird, you know? And I think that there's, there's significance behind words is that God didn't just throw it in there and be like, yeah, I want to trip up some, some people in Mainville, Ohio one day. That's not why he did it. Why did God put that in there? Why did God use Luke to write these words down in Acts? Does this mean that transportation in the Spirit is for today? Next time you're stuck in traffic, me as a believer, I'm Spirit-filled. I'm just going to ask for the Lord. Bam, me and my Honda Odyssey, we're out of here. Is that what God wants us to know for today? Does this mean that transportation is for today? As much as I'd like to debate that point is, should we have teleportation in the Spirit? I don't think that's the point God is making here. I don't think that God wants us to spend much time talking about whether or not teleportation is for today or not, or angel communication. We need to stay close to the scriptures and wonder, why did God do that to Philip? Right? Sometimes we project ourselves into the scripture and be like, bam, angel communication, teleportation. What does that mean for my life? Well, let's stay close to the scriptures and see what was the reason for angels communicating with Philip? What was the reason for him to be transported? Okay. It seems to me that he intentionally took him up so that he may continue sharing. What's the whole point of angel communication and teleportation? It's sharing the gospel. Revival's happening. Angel speaks to Philip, go to the desert. Why? To share the gospel. Many times Christians, more refined Christians, want to debate this continuation, continuationism, cessationism. Are these particular gifts for today? Are these gifts for today? I think that's a fine conversation to have, certainly. But what's a great equalizer for all of that chatter? When was the last time you shared the good news of Jesus with somebody? We want to devour Bible study after Bible study. Do the next thing. Fill this up. But are we trying to move the needle and be doers of God's word rather than just hearers? Angel communication, teleportation. Why? To share the gospel. What's the big idea God is trying to communicate with us? What is he telling us? It's this. Every believer whether you're seven and just became a follower of him, whether you're 80, this is for you. Every believer is to teach the gospel with intentionality to all people, ready in all circumstances, by the Spirit, period. End of story. There is no excuse. So why share? This message is life or death. Yet we live our lives as if this message is not that important and urgent. Let Antioch and the gathering be places where we say, we will be people that will share the gospel. We will be willing to go. We will be willing to engage. We will be willing to share. Because we're going to live our life on mission. And it would have been really easy for Philip, in the spirit, to go desert sees the chariot, then sees a guy reading scripture and be like, you know what? That guy's reading Isaiah. That guy must be a Christian. But he wasn't. 
Interest does not mean that you're a follower of Jesus. Just because someone shows up to a church doesn't mean that they're a Christian. Just because a car is in a garage or a person is in a, a garage doesn't mean they're a car, right? So let me put it to you in these terms. This message is very important. It's incredibly urgent. Say your house. You, you had everyone together. You're having Thanksgiving. The turkey. Fire. But you invited everyone. Friends, family, everyone in your neighborhood. They're all over. Fire. Everyone runs outside. Well, you're out. You, you know you make it out. But you don't see everyone that you saw in the house. You know that there's still a few people that you didn't see, that you once saw in the house, but now you don't see anymore. Our response to that wouldn't be, ah, you know, I bet they're probably on the other side of the house. You know what? I bet they're probably running down to the, the fire station to go tell them about the fire. If we knew that there was a chance that someone might still be in the burning house, we would run in and go try to find them. And to make sure that this person got out. This message is incredibly important because our world is burning. Christians get to be a part of helping be, be a part of this restoration process that God has started. But this world is burning. We stand in the judgment of God. And the only question he will ask is, do you have my son? Yes or no? We need to make sure that the, the person that's here at our church services knows Christ. Just because they're here doesn't make them a Christian. We need to ask good questions to figure out where they're at with Jesus. And then what's, what's the other circumstance in that burning house situation? Is that if we knew for certain that someone was still in that house and we're not going after them, what are we doing? That we know someone is standing under the judgment of God, yet we're not going and sharing. Now, granted, we can't share with everyone. We can't save everyone. This is, this is only God's work, right? Ephesians 2 says that this faith is not your own. It's God's. But God, being rich in mercy, made us alive together with Christ so that no one may boast. Right? This is his work. But God's will is carried out through us. We have to share. We have to give people an opportunity to respond. We have to get people out of the fire or at least tell them the way out. So how to share. I'm sure you all may feel very overwhelmed by this, but friend, cut through all of the miraculous that happen. The, you know, the angel communication, the, the, you know, leaping onto the chariot and all of this. Guys, you don't have to Tom Cruise jump. You don't have to encounter an angel. You don't have to have a theology degree to be able to share some with somebody about Jesus. Mark Dever says this in his book on discipling. He says that, that if you're truly saved, let me actually just read the quote just so I don't mess it up. If you're truly following Christ, all of you, uh, all you need to do is share what you do know, not what you don't know. If you know for certain that you've escaped the judgment of God for loving relationship with him, and you know that, you can explain it to somebody else, right? It would be weird for you to like drive here to church and someone was like, how did you get here? And they're like, I don't know. That would be weird, right? If you know how to enter into a relationship with God, then you know. So therefore you can tell other people on how to know, right? You just got to share with what the Lord's already done in your life and what you know to be true in the scriptures. A lot of times we, we get nervous about evangelism because we, we don't know how to, you know, dice it all out. But what if we just sat down with the scriptures like we see here with Philip and the eunuch? 
hey, what do you think about this? What about this? Tell me what you think this says. I think it says something about a clown. No, that's when you share, right? This is actually talking about the person of Jesus, right? And, and we have to be led by the Spirit to figure out, when do I ask a good question? And when do I need to say something? When do I need to share definitively what this is saying? So how do you share? Asking good questions and just giving other people what you already know. And then two, how do you share? Do it by the Spirit. When was the last time you prayed for the Lord to open up an opportunity for you to share with somebody? When was the last time you said, Lord, what would be a good question for me to ask this person? Lord, what do you want me to say? Lord, open up an opportunity. Give me the words to say. And how can we do this? It's because he's with you. We can evangelize. We can share the good news of Jesus because he is with us. Philippians 1.6 has just been ministering to my heart. It's that he, it says, he, I'm sure of this. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Right? All of us, when we start following Jesus, you know, it, he, he's not just going to be like, you know what? Welcome to Christianity. See you later, Buster. I'll see you in heaven. That would be weird, right? He is with you and he's helping you accomplish the things that he's called you to do. He's with you always to the end of the age. God is with you right now and can lead you. Gathering church. Let us be a people that shares about the good news of Jesus. That engages others with love and compassion. The same kind of engagement that Jesus engaged us with. That he didn't stay in heaven and send a messenger to us. He left heaven himself to come be born in a manger, a dirty manger, to proclaim the good news about himself. God is not a distant God. And if we want to align ourselves with the character of God, we need to engage as he's engaged the world. And then lastly, we need to go. God left heaven to come here to get us. If we want to be little Christs, Christians, we have to go to. Okay. So let me pray for us. Lord, we ask that you would do this good work in us. Bring this work that you've started in us to completion, God. Help us love you more. I don't love you as much as I want. I don't love your great commission as much as I want. I don't love others as much as I want. Lord, continue to grow this area in my life. And I'm so thankful for the times that my love for you is fleeting. My love for your great commission is gone. My love for others is weak. You still accept me. Lord, help me love you. Help me love the things that you love. And help me obey you. I don't just want to be a hearer of your word. I want to be a doer. Uh, Lord, would you bring to mind one person to bring to church or to share with for all of us this week? We want to use our lives well and leverage ourselves for your kingdom in your everlasting name. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.